Hi all and welcome to this virtual uh, Berkman Klein talk uh, series. And um, I still see some participants joining, so I'll take it slowly here. Um, but first of all, welcome all to this uh, series and this kind of like unusual setting, at least for, for the Berkman Klein Center in these very unusual times. Uh, on your screen, you can see some of the house rules that we have. Most notably, audio and video have been turned off for you. Uh, so you can, we'll only be able to see the slides as well as the presenters, that is Adrian and me. Uh, if you've got questions during the talk, uh, submit them through our through Zoom's Q&A tool and we'll basically th go through those uh, questions and answer them after the talk. Um, and the, after the talk as well, the public chat will be enabled. So right now you can't be, you know, you can't chat with other folks, but once the talk is over, you'll be able to, to do that more interactively uh, as we've kind of like learned in the past that this can be a little distracting if the public chat will be enabled throughout. And finally, uh, a word of caution, as usual with these talks for Berkman, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, and so, you know, like if your questions are being asked and, you know, we might mention your name. So keep that in mind. Um, or, you know, if you don't want your ma name mentioned, just add that to your question, please. Um, with that having said, I'll now, I'll now, share my screen with you um, and hello all in this virtual environment. Uh, today, Adrian and I will talk about our research on bot detection or more specifically on the issues of bot detection. And so this talk as follows is structured in a way that first I will guide you through kind of like our thoughts and how we kind of like structured our paper, uh, what kind of like the situation is that we're in right now when it comes to bot detection. Uh, and then Adrian will guide you through our results and, and give you kind of like some thoughts on, on what we think can be done and maybe should be done. Um, but first and foremost, we are just very happy uh, that you chose to join us online. And uh, you know, like these times are, quite stressful and uncertain and I'm very thankful that you're participating here and I hope you all are uh, safe out there. Um, so when it comes to, you know, and this is a very abrupt change, but when it comes to bot detection, which is a very more like abstract topic, we kind of like have to take a step back and think about the public interest or worry really in bots and how this has increased over time. You can see the plot on the right uh, that is from Media Cloud. So this is just media attention in the US media between January 2015 and April 2020 for bots and fake news misinformation or disinformation. And this kind of like just shows you that really after fall 2016, so after the presidential election in the US, the public attention and probably worry about bots and kind of like misinformation really, really skyrocketed. Uh, and this is not only true for kind of like the public and the media interest, but really also for academic research. So Google Scholar has 18,900 hits for me when I search for bots and Twitter since 2016. Uh, I couldn't use Scopus because as many of you are, I'm working remotely. And so I had to, uh, take uh, Google Scholar as my database of reference. And so this just shows you kind of like that, this field of bot research and kind of like what, what's the role of bots in our public discourse is an urgent one, right? I think no one is disputing that we all would love to know kind of like how many automated accounts that spread political messages or other messages are really out there, you know, like we all want to know if we debate with someone online, whether that person is a person or really a bot. Right, so there is a need and an urgency for that. And indeed, you know, like there have been studies in recent years and articles about this. So this is, for example, a Pew study from 2018 uh, called Bots in the Twitter Sphere, and where they say an estimated two thirds of tweeted links to popular websites are posted by automated accounts, not human beings. 
Another study uh, that was covered by The Guardian this year had the headline revealed, quarter of all tweets about climate, cr climate crisis produced by bots. Uh, this, I think it was by Gizmodo, this is an op-ed which says social media bots are damaging our democracy. On the internet, nobody knows your natural language processing system. So again, really, you know, like it's not a worry. It's not only a worry, it's also, you know, it, it, it might be really bad for our democracy, right? And finally, you know, like all different kinds of things, tweets about cannabis health benefits are full of mistruths. Uh, this was, I believe, on the conversation about a Twitter analysis that some academics have done. And this is kind of like the interface that we're kind of like looking at between academics doing research and kind of like looking at discourses on Twitter and being like, okay, how can we measure this? What's happening there? Then writing a, a study and then kind of like this getting out in the media and the public discussing about this, right? And so the importance of the academic, of the rigor of the academic research is, you know, warranted in that regard, because often kind of like academic discussions and studies are usually staying within academia here. It's not only in academia, it's also out in the, out in the world and out in the media. So when we talk about bots, we kind of like, you know, have to think about the terminology and we just like have some definitions here, for example, by Chu et al, who say bots are automated programs but they kind of like also differentiate between bots and cyborgs. That is bot assisted humans or human assisted bots. That is kind of like, think of a Twitter program and sometimes a human will also write tweets from that account. But this is only one of many definitions that you'll find out there when you kind of like look in the literature. Another is by Kolani, Howard and Wooley from the OII, uh, back then at least, who defined bots as automate interaction with other users. So this is already kind of like, it's about the interaction with other users. It's not only like, you know, like that they send messages into the vortex. Third, it's from Bessie and Ferrara, who, who not talk about bots, but about social bots, who emulate the activity of human users, but operate at much higher pace, while successfully keeping the artificial identity undisclosed. This again is a different definition. And you kind of like can see that like from definition to definition, the line and the lines of what's a bot and what's not a bot begin to blur. And finally, Bot Sentinel is a website out there uh, that came up with the term troll bot, which they define as troll like behavior with a repetitive bot like nature of their trolling. Uh, where, you know, like it's really unclear if that's even a bot or not. And, you know, like, in that kind of like sense, does it even matter if it's a bot or not? And so you kind of like, you see that definition wise, you kind of like have a broad field. And so we believe that it's kind of like important to you know, take a step back and say, for us, bots are fully automated accounts. And you know, that's for us is the end of it, not because we do not account and believe that there are different ways out there that bots are being used, but rather because we don't believe that like this, all these terminologies help us kind of like figuring out what we want to study. That is, you know, how many bots can we identify on Twitter? Uh, and we, when I talk about bots, you know, like there are some very obvious bots out there, like the museum bot or the Soviet art bot, often accounts, you know, like that have their uh, engineer in the description and a link to the GitHub repo. So how do you identify bots or how have, you know, scholars and uh, journalists and researchers thought about uh, going about this. Uh, there are different ways. Uh, there's the frequentist approach, which is really just saying, you know, every account that tweets more than 50 times a day is a bot. There's a network analysis approach where kind of like look at the follower communities. Uh, there's the machine learning algorithm where you say, okay, we know these accounts are bots and these accounts are humans and we train this algorithm so that it will detect these going forward. Uh, there's digital forensics, which is kind of like a mixture of human inspection and these other tools. And finally, human inspection, where it's just really just you look at the account and you look at what they tweet and you kind of like try to make sense, you know, like does the image fit, etc. So here in our talk, we focus on machine learning algorithms, most on namely Bottometer, which can be understood as the gold standard in social science uh, research to identify bots on Twitter. Indeed, if you kind of like look through the literature, you'll find several hundred studies that have used Bottometer 
uh, including in kind of like communication journals, like political communication, but also, for example, in general science journals like science. And so, you know, Bottometer is by far the most used tool in that regard. And so we believe it's valid kind of like to ask, you know, how, how good is Bottometer? Uh, and, you know, I went through Bottometer with these two bots that I just showed you. And the Bottometer score here is 2.4 and 2.3. So, you know, it's in the middle. Like Bottometer is kind of like saying, you know, it depends. The whole left, like blue is not a bot, red is a bot. So it's right in the middle. Uh, if you're wondering, and if you've never used Bottometer, how it works, this is the web interface. Uh, and you log in with your Twitter credentials and then you can just check users. And what you'll get to see here is what I've done yesterday. And I checked Adrian's and my account. Uh, and apparently Adrian is a little bodier than me, but still I think we're both uh, relatively in the clear and tend not to be a bot according to Bottometer. Uh, so what you see here are the universal scores. You can see this also on the next slide where I looked at Adrian's uh, account and where we can get two important values. That is the complete automation probability, which is 1% and the universal score. These are the two main values that you'll also get from the Bottometer API. Uh, and, with, and those are the values with which researchers usually work. Uh, most prominently, however, researchers will take the universal score, which is then resampled to zero to one, where zero is not a bot, one is bot, and they will choose thresholds and above or be below those thresholds, it will either be a bot or not a bot. So Pew, for example, had a threshold of around like, I think 0.43 and everything below 0.43 was not a bot and everything above 0.43 was a bot. And that is the universal score in that context. Uh, and if you talk about these classifiers and Bottometer is a classifier, right? We talk about pitfalls and what can go wrong. And we see this currently actually with the coronavirus uh, and testing where it's really important how good is the test, right? And this is very similar with classifiers, like how good is this actually? And so if you have a sample of 50% bots and 50% human users, the question is what pitfalls can there happen? Generally speaking, you know, you will have a classified data set and within that classified data set, you will have true positives. That is in our case, the bots that we identified are bots and you will have false positives. That is, you will have humans that have been, that have been classified as bots, but obviously aren't. And usually, you know, like this is something that you will never really like get rid of, but obviously kind of like want to reduce the false positives and have a high true positive rate. However, an issue arises here that is, that is not the only pitfall that you have because true positives and false positives only tell parts of the story. Indeed, it's also a precision. That is from the, all the accounts that got classified, the question is how many of these classifieds were actually correctly classified? Like how many bots were selected within the classified data? That is precision. And we've got the recall. So how many bots were actually selected, correctly selected from all the bots that we have in our data set? So when we think and going forward for this talk, it's important to differentiate between true positives, false positives, precision, and recall. And you'll find out later why that is and why we can like talk about this. But more specifically, because there's an issue if we only look at true positives and false positives, namely that this data set doesn't really happen on Twitter because it rather looks like this, where we have about 15% of all users according to Twitter, are bots and the rest are humans. And so this is not really being accounted for. And you'll see the impact of that. So this is all theory. And this is kind of like all the aspects that we thought about in the last one and a half years while doing this project. Um, just coming up really with this question, like how precise is this tool in detecting bots? And we've got four bigger questions and or smaller questions in that regard, I think. That is, how good is the diagnostic ability of Bottometer when used for five distinct sets of Twitter accounts? How good is the precision and the recall of Bottometer scores when used for five distinct sets of Twitter accounts representing the bot human ratio in the general Twitter population? So not only in our data sets, but also 
when we resample this for the general Twitter population, which is kind of like what we're really interested in, right? But also what's the difference between the languages here? We know roughly that there's a difference between how good, for example, Bodomita works in English and Swedish based on other studies. And finally, how stable is Bodomita over time? Because usually how studies go about it is they collect their data, they run their data through the Bodomita API and one time, and then they have the results. And that's usually it. And we're kind of like also interested in how does these, how do these values change over time? So what we did is we constructed a data set of five different data sets. Namely, we had clear humans, clear bots, and a training set from Bottometer. The humans were US politicians. You use some examples here, usually verified. We have German politicians, mostly verified, but all, you know, like all accounts that were clearly humans and, you know, the media would notify the public if something really weird and fishy would go on. That is automation in one or the other regard. And finally, we also looked at bots, right? We went to a, a wiki that has Twitter bots on them. Those are usually, you know, very transparent Twitter bots. So if we were to do a human inspection, we would all be like, oh yeah, that's a bot. Uh, and we did this for new bot, uh, for new English language bots as well as German bots. And then, as I said, the bots that were used to train Bottometer initially. We had then this data set uh, of 400, 4,000 something accounts that we then queried Bottometer with. And we queried Bottometer for three months. So we kind of like wanted to really have like a lot of uh, reference scores to then calculate our scores. And with that, I'll now uh, let Adrian guide you through the results. All right. Many thanks, Jonas. So let me start with the um, five different data sets that we have created for our analysis because Jonas has already introduced the single data sets and to really test a, a classifier, a binary classifier, we have to of course um, use data sets that have both bots and human accounts. So the first data set we use is like just all the accounts uh, we have identified together that's here um, read the all, then we combined the German politicians and the German bots, but we only had a ver identified very few German bots. That's why we created also like a third combined data set with the German politicians together with the English bots. And then we have a fourth data set, the US politicians together with the English language bots. And then as a fifth data set, we used um, the data set uh, created by the first um, that was uh, used for the, uh, to, to, to kind of like train the classifier by the creators of Bottometer. So usually when you um, want to report um, or analyze the diagnostic ability of a classifier, you report something called the ROC um, curve, which stands for receiver operating char characteristic. And then you calculate the area under the curve. So this means like the area that is covered um, by the curve, what, what follows under it. So the larger that area, the better actually the classifier. So let me start. Um, what you usually plot is like for every single threshold. And for us, the bottom meter score goes from zero to one. So we start on the right hand side with a bottom meter threshold um, of zero. So if you say your threshold is zero in every account that gets a score above zero, you classify as a bot, you get a perfect um, true positive rate. This means that you will identify all bots within your data set. But at the same time, of course, every single human user in your data set will also be classified wrongly as a bot, which means you get a perfect false positive rate. Uh, of one. That's why you start on the right hand side uh, in the upper corner um, with these visualizations. Then on the other hand, if you move up with uh, the threshold, you increase the threshold, then eventually, of course, you can use the, the highest possible threshold um, of uh, just below one, maybe. And then what you get is actually a true positive rate that maybe includes only one bot, so below even 1%. But at the same time, you also reduce, of course, the false 
positive rate because no human account will be classified as a bot, wrongly classified as a bot. But at the same time, you won't really identify also any of the bots in your data. So we, com we compare here in this visualization the different um, data sets and we used actually the mean over the three months. So every day we measured once um, the score for every account. And for this part of the anal analysis, we just took the mean, the average score that an account received um, over the three months. And what you can see here already that the US politicians and bots uh, curve, the ROC curve for that data set um, is better than uh, the other curves. As you can see, the German politicians and bots, as well as the German politicians and German bots, um, they are a little bit worse. Uh, the area under the curve is actually smaller. And you see that here as a summary, this is usually what is also recorded in studies and also the bottom meter creator report the ROC in their paper. And it's pretty high actually in their original paper. And here you see the US politicians and bots, they really receive the highest ROC um, area under the curve score. Whereas the German bots and uh, uh, the German politicians and the German politicians with the English language bots together get a rather low um, overall ROC AUC score of uh, 0 0.76 and 0 0.77. So the problem is like with the ROC AUC um, approach, you get like relative values, you get a percentage basically for a single part of the data set. Like you get one uh, uh, measurement uh, for the bots and you get another one only based on the human accounts. So Jonas has already mentioned it. When we use this classifier, our target population is not our training data set or an artificial data set that is balanced in reality, actually. Um, we want to analyze the Twitter population. And within the Twitter population, we can assume, I think we all can agree on that, that we have less bots than human users. And of course, there is no clear number for that. But you find numbers like 15% of the accounts active on Twitter are actually bots. So we try to create a new data set that has this kind of imbalance because an uh, imbalance data set is what you will actually um, uh, see in the real world when you analyze um, Twitter outside of your experimental setting or test setting. So we created a new random sample with replacement uh, with uh, 100,000, uh, uh, each data set, we, we created a new version of it like with 100,000 accounts, but we adjusted um, the probability weights um, during the sampling process that in the end we get basically a data set um, with 15,000 bots and 85,000 um, human accounts. But I told you already before, um, the ROC approach actually gives you relative values. So no matter how imbalanced the data set is, as long as you use more or less the same um, population or the same kind of accounts, you will actually get the same um, ROC AUC score here. On the left-hand side, we see the original one based on the training or our, our uh, data sets. Most of them are actually balanced. And then on the right-hand side here, uh, which is like labeled as sample, you see the uh, new data sets we've created with the imbalance with only 15% uh, bots. So the scores here are overall the same. However, if you use as a measurement actually the precision, which analyzes like it, it shows here with the imbalance one, it analyzes like from all the identified accounts that are above a threshold, how many of them are actually bots in our case, right? And if it's an imbalanced, um, uh, data set, even a very small false positive rate or overall false positive rate will lead to a high absolute number of um, uh, wrongly classified human accounts that are suddenly uh, classified as, uh, as bots. And the number of bots is actually smaller within this uh, uh, identified um, part. So what does it mean for the PR? the precision recall area under the curve 
On the left hand side, you see the, the PR scores um, for the uh, original data sets, which of course in most cases is better because the data actually is more balanced. And then in contrast to that, on the right hand side, you see the PR score um, for our um, newly created um, uh, imbalanced uh, data sets. The only value that actually increases what you can see here is the German politicians and German bots. Uh, the PR score here uh, is smaller for the original one because we had very few uh, German bots. So we had less than 15% overall in that data set. So when we created a new data set, actually um, the score increased because um, we had to add more bots. But for all the other values, actually it gets uh, worse. So let me show you visually what that means. So if we compare the two PR curves, the one for the original data sets and the other one for the resample, for the in newly created imbalanced data set, then you can see here, for example, for the data set all, the curve gets pushed down. So the precision, that's really the value we're interested in, gets worse actually. The curves look more or less the same because we sample from the same population and the recall of course uh, stays uh, the same. But you see here for the German politicians and the bots on the right hand side that it really pushes down um, this uh, curve. I will now explain uh, what it really means and how you can interpret uh, these curves on the next slide here. So these curves, you read a little bit differently than the ROC curves. You start really on the right-hand side with a bottom-meter threshold of zero, and on the left-hand side, you plot actually the thresholds um, that are the highest. So from zero on the right-hand side up to uh, the left-hand side um, with a threshold of one. So again, if we take the lowest possible threshold and we say like um, every account that gets a bottom-meter score of, of, of uh, at least above zero, right? Um, we will classify that um, account as a bot. We actually get the proportion of the population. And as I have told you before, now in our newly created data set, we have 15% bots and 85% um, human users. So the precision is exactly 15% because we get all the bots, but at the same time, you also get all the humans uh, so we have 85% actually wrongly classified accounts. So we plotted also um, into uh, this, this visualization uh, points that show you uh, thresholds that were used in um, already published studies. So the one more in the middle are actually um, the points. These, these points show you the threshold of a zero point uh, four three, that's the threshold as uh, Jonas has already mentioned before uh, for the Pew study. And if you take, for example, the data set all, you can see actually the precision is not that great. It's actually 0 0.5. So um, if you say all accounts that have a score higher than uh, 0 0.43, um, the identified accounts, 50% of them actually will be bots, but the other 50% will be false positives. They will be um, human users. If you do the same for the German um, politicians and bots data set, as you can see, performs a, a lot worse. Um, it's even less, actually. It's more in the 30% range of like uh, the, the number of bots um, that you will um, identify and um, more like uh, over 60% are uh, human users. The uh, points on the left hand side are um, the thresholds for uh, 0.76. These were used in the German context uh, in a study that is published in uh, political communication. And as you can see there, it's a rather conservative threshold, right? It's a pretty high one, 0.76. Um, you still you still get like uh, uh, a lot of like uh, wrongly classified uh, human users into into the data, and only around twenty five percent of the as uh, bot classified accounts are really bots. And at the same time, and this is the recall, right? Um, um, 
uh, that you can see here uh, on the x-axis, the recall is very low if you use a very conservative um, uh, threshold. So conservative here means a very high one where you of course want to reduce the false positives, but when you use a very high threshold, at the same time you will identify very few bots from the overall population of bots within your data set. So what this visualization also shows you, um, there is obviously a visual difference between um, the quality of classification uh, between the English language more general uh, corpus um, versus the German uh, corpus, which is here a lot worse. So here is a summary, all the scores. Um, what is here interesting for us actually is the last row with the um, PR scores. And you can see the German um, data sets uh, perform a lot worse with photometer, whereas um, the English language um, um, data sets all have a higher score um, for the ROC as well as the uh, PR. Um, these differences are also uh, significant. You can read more about this in the paper. So there's also a test to really check whether it's, it's significant. So as a last step, we also wanted to find out whether photometer um, gives stable uh, scores, whether there's like a, a, a low uh, volatility or a high volatility. And we have like selected a few of the accounts. So here we have a, a far right um, politician from the alternative of, uh, for Germany, Alice Weidel. Um, you see here over the three months, uh, 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 the scores plotted that we uh, measured on every day. And there's a lot of volatility. And if you take the threshold from the two study uh, where you say like um, every account that gets a score higher than 0 0.43 is a bot, actually here uh, just at the end of March, she would have, um, she would have been a bot. Whereas um, on other days, actually, uh, uh, during these three months, um, she would have been classified as a uh, human. But there's a lot of volatility. So let's go to the next one. This is like an interesting one. A uh, US politician, actually a Republican, um, has a very low bot uh, photometer score in the beginning, but then it increases. And towards the end, also again, based on the Pew, um, um, Pew study threshold, he would have been classified um, as a bot. And as a last one, we have, of course, chosen a bot. This is uh, Jonas. Uh, Jonas has identified this one. It's the Boston Snowbot. And as you can see here, obviously, the Boston Snowbot is, is tweeting when there is snow. And uh, it seems like in March, I don't know Boston well, there was some snow, but then um, towards the um, uh, uh, towards April and then starting from April, somehow probably this bot wasn't really active anymore. Um, we think here also like photometer captured probably um, the activity level and it was uh, far more active um, in March than in April and maybe even stopped um, in April. So what we see here with these uh, very uh, few cases already, there's a lot of volatility. Um, if you think about most bot studies, they only measure the bot score once on a specific day and not like over time and try to take an average. And this really can be an issue depending on the day. Uh, uh, an account will be a bot um, with a certain threshold and on another day, he won't be um, a bot. But we also have like a summary, this one you find also in the paper where we really check over the, um, over the three months um, for every single threshold actually, um, whether an account was at least once above and once below um, the threshold with, with the score. And if you take here, for example, on the left-hand side with the threshold universal score, a threshold of 0 0.4, which is very near again to the Pew study, then you see um, over 55%, this is the red line um, of the new bots, um, of the English language bots we identified, um, they had um, at least once on a day a score above that threshold of 0 0.4 and once during the three months at least once a score below the threshold. So as you can see, the same holds true for the German bots. Um, with the human users, it really 
um, depends. Um, it's maybe less problematic, but still pretty high. For example, you can see here the German politicians, again, on the left-hand side, if we take um, a threshold of 0 0.4, we still get around 30% um, of the users that at least have once a score above the threshold and once a score below the threshold during these three months. All right, then we're at the end. Um, so what's the conclusion? What, what are the learnings here? Um, we should, of course, be very careful when we're using botometer because the scores are not stable. There are problems with the language. Maybe it works with English. It doesn't mean it works in other uh, languages. And then um, what we believe is really um, our kind of like the, uh, the strongest message. It's like we really should consider the imbalanced uh, sample, right? So the populations we're analyzing with a classifier, the population maybe is not as balanced as our training data. And this is a general problem also if you read the literature about uh, classifiers in uh, bioinformatics. Um, there are a lot of discussions uh, about that um, if tests um, are developed and then used in a real population. So you also have, and this one we haven't mentioned before, you have to consider what is more important or what is more costly, false positives or false negatives. But this is also something beyond our paper, um, but definitely a question that every single researcher, when he approaches uh, the problem of bots, um, should answer. So how should we uh, go forward? Um, we recommend, of course, as a communication scientists, always do some manual validation. Just because a classifier was validated in a prior study doesn't mean it, it still works with the new data set or a new population. So, for example, in the Swedish case, some colleagues have tested Botometer, they got very bad scores. So, the decision was like they created their own classifier for their specific Swedish data set, and then it worked. Um, it got better ROC scores, but also better precision. So you need uh, also to validate over time. This is something very general. We think also in general, any kind of classifier that analyzes Twitter data or Twitter accounts, even maybe beyond just um, um, bot analysis, they should consider that if it's not like stable um, over time, then of course the validation in different languages, this is more from a, let's say, European or Asian perspective uh, that is for us maybe obvious, but for a lot of uh, US researchers maybe less obvious when they create their um, classifier. So of course, if we now uh, move forward and say, Botometer didn't work well, um, we can just create a new classifier. It's very easy now based on this data set to almost create a perfect classifier. I mean, I can just create an ad hoc classifier where I check whether bot is mentioned in the description or in the username. And, and, and then uh, the classifier already works pretty, pretty well, actually. But that is definitely not enough, even when there will be a new uh, classifier available that maybe was validated when other researchers will use it in the future. They have to validate it again, like we say. So if you're interested in that, please read our paper. We explain there in more detail um, how to uh, uh, move ahead, um, but also all the technical parts are explained in more detail. And of course, what we also call for, we say these kind of black box tools where the code is not available and the full data set with all the measurements that uh, was used to create these classifiers, if that one is not available, that's a problem, right? We cannot really reproduce uh, one to one exactly the same uh, classifier. And we need that to evaluate actually the quality of the classifier to really understand where the classifier is biased. We can now only somehow reverse engineer it or do some guesswork based on single examples where there is a bias. So we also share, of course, when we call for more transparency, we also share our data. You find the code in the data in the Harvard Dataverse. So that's it from my side. Many thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, I'll now have the double function of being both basically host uh, and asking questions as well, maybe answering some questions. 
Uh, also, a special thank you to Adrian because he's in Taipei at National Taiwan University. And it's uh, oh, at 12.40 a.m. there right now. So thank you for staying up so late. Um, the first question actually reached us via email before the event had even started. So uh, we want to give space for that too. And the question is, what do you think are the prospects for passing federal regulation on bots in the near future? And how do you view state laws on bots being carried out? And as Adrian is uh, an expert in that regard, I would want him to go first. <laughs> expert, it's a, it's a very interesting question because like two years um, ago, before I, I came to Taipei, um, when I was back, still back in Switzerland, um, uh, a group of Swiss uh, members of parliament invited me to Bern and we had a kind of like a closed door discussion with some legal experts that have written also papers about like bot regulation or potential bot regulation and they um, had this idea um, of like regulating bots because they they read all these stories in the media right um, about like uh, bots take over uh, democracy or it's uh, the biggest threat to, to, to democracy and then we had this discussion and even back then I was um, rather um, skeptical so let me start now based on our analysis now we can say it's very difficult first of all from a conceptual perspective right and I, I'm not a legal scholar but you need to be very clear what you mean by a bot if you want to regulate that one, right, the object. It's very difficult. Then uh, as a second point, it's very difficult to kind of like identify bots, like to measure, measure it. Um, um, often it's not really clear who is a bot, then there are like uh, um, uh, uh, accounts that have some, some a certain degree of uh, automation, uh, but then there are also like humans behind it. So it's very difficult to identify them and also very difficult, at least at this point, to define it. Um, however, and this was really uh, the last point um, that we were discussing there, and actually the legal experts back then, at least the Swiss ones, they also agreed uh, with me and other people involved in this discussion that probably we have to ask the question of like how, how um, how big of a threat are bots in comparison to other threats to democracy, but also like um, what's the effect of these bots? And uh, what we can say, or uh, a lot of like political communication scholars say, more traditional political communication scholars, they say it's very difficult to change the opinion of people in general, even like with strong campaign techniques. So of course, um, if at all there is an effect, it will be a very small, probably a very small effect. And at the same time, if we think about foreign interference, and now I'm speaking more from a Swiss perspective, but also I can speak from a Taiwanese uh, perspective, there was also this debate before the presidential election here in January, like the China threat, right? Especially online uh, warfare. Um, however, if you have a, a broader perspective, um, I would say the biggest threats actually um, are offline. So in the Taiwanese case, for example, there's the discussion of direct proxies, probably that's far more effective. So this means you go over organizations or persons or even politicians, right? Of course, that is happening. And if you want to fight foreign interference, you should start with the biggest issue or where there is the biggest threat. And I strongly believe um, um, bots are probably not the biggest threat. At the same time, of course, and this was also the conclusion in Bern back then, we should keep an eye on it. Maybe the situation, of course, is changing. There will be new developments and maybe in the future, in a certain context, bots might be a problem. But at the moment, it doesn't, it's, 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 we, we, we were advising against a, a regulation um, and I think the same, I would still say today. Um, it's very difficult and I, I, I wonder how it's possible to regulate it. And then at the same time, is it really the biggest issue we, we cope with at the moment? Thank you. And uh, I think I, I don't really have much to add to that. My, my intuition is uh, before and after doing the study that um, if you do, try to implement a regulation that the limits of the regulation in the end will be so tight that you won't 
capture a lot of aspects, which then mm -hmm. in turn just like ask the question how you know effective will be the regulation in the first place. Plus, I don't you know like I don't in the end see bots as kind of like the biggest problem, even when we think about um, misinformation. Um, a second question then, and this is maybe one for you, uh, Adrian, as well, is from Bao Bao, uh, and she asks, could a classifier like Botometer use Bayesian methods to take into account the imbalance between bots and real humans on Twitter? They can use what's the latest breakdown of bots versus humans as their prior. Theoretically, yes, you can, you can even, it's, it's more about like testing, testing your classifier. So during the validation phase, you need to take that um, into uh, consideration. So if someone tells you here, I have a new classifier, it works perfectly well, um, has a very high ROC score over 0.9, and then um, uh, you wanna use it, of course you should validate it. So you could validate that um, a new classifier with um, your own data from the population. And when you use a data set to again validate it, then you need to be careful to uh, not use uh, a balanced uh, data set where you have like 50% bots and 50% um, uh, human users. You can use that to train the classifier to add more information, put more emphasis on uh, one group, but um, to validate it actually, and that one you have seen now in the presentation, with the precision, you should take this um, imbalance um, into account. And then there, you have, of course, different methods um, how, to, um, how, to, how, to, how to test it, right? Um, a Bayesian approach itself, I, I'm a big fan of Bayesian um, regression models or in general of this um, uh, paradigm or way of thinking. But ad hoc, I can't think of like um, how to use it. Of course, you should always, this is here the idea, right? Um, uh, of course, the mindset is similar. We take into account, we have some priors, right? We assume the population is not balanced. Um, I would just say the validation gets better if you use such an approach. But um, if the classifier then itself is better, I don't know. Awesome, thank you. Um... The next question, and this is, uh, we have several methods question and, and more general ones, and I'm just like gonna switch between those. And so the next one is from Rod, and he asks, or he first says, thanks for that fantastic perspective. Given that Oxford Internet Institute's research points to the increasing disinformation architecture of countries like India, Russia, and Iran, can you point to work, if any, being done on multilingual sentiment analysis? I answer. Please, go ahead. Very, again, it's exactly the same. I would say if you're talking about sentiment analysis, and, and let's ignore all the conceptual discussion about what is sentiment. Let's say you can really measure sentiment, right? And it works pretty well in one language. Um, if you want to do it uh, multi-language and you're interested in the comparative perspective where something is stronger or, or weaker, of course, you need to validate it, not only in every single language, you also have to check whether um, it's similar in every different language, the scale, right, and the strength of the sentiment. Then I could start with the cultural question, whether these kind of like sentiments are really the same within a, a, a culture, maybe a, a strong sentiment uh, in um, Taiwanese culture or expressed sentiment is stronger than just a strong sentiment in the US culture, right? where it has to be even stronger to be considered um, extremely strong, right? But whereas here in Taiwan, a uh, strong sentiment would be already considered as an extremely strong one. Again, validate. Um, I also test this always with my students. Don't just take um, these out of, the, out of the box solutions without any validation. Um, some of my colleagues in communication science have um, tried to revalidate a lot of these um, um, word lists that are used um, for sentiment analysis. And actually, if you don't do anything, you don't change these um, word lists um, and you try to validate them in a new context, they don't work at all. So as a baseline usually, and this comes more from communication science again, 
you need to set a gold standard. The gold standard is usually the human coding, and then you're matching whether the human coding is the same as the as what the, the sentiment um, classifier or the sentiment analysis uh, measures, whether there's like a, a strong overlap. So between different languages, very difficult, but what I can tell you, if you have a list for a specific language, if you just do it in one language, you need to change the word list for the specific context. It can work quite well, actually. But again, you need to validate it. If it's not validated, I would be very skeptical. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, really, I think like was like six minutes into the presentation is like on the, we want to know if we are debating a person or a bot issue. Is it your sense that there are bots that can pass that particular version of the Turing test? And I'm just going to take that question myself uh, first. And I'm also excited to hear Adrian's opinion uh, from everything I've seen on Twitter. I would say no. Uh, I think a lot of these, you know, like Twitter just debates especially are usually short. And so you don't have a lot of time. And I would say also like in more heated discussions, probably a lot of projections going on. Um, and I haven't seen anything that would kind of like point me to a different opinion on that. What do you think, Adrian? Yes, I, I agree with you. I can maybe add one more point from uh, two German colleagues, uh, Pascal Jürgens and uh, Simon Kruszynski. They also um, uh, analyze um, astroturfing and um, automation on actually on Facebook. And what they say is actually the other way around. You will be surprised um, how many human users use very simple communication patterns that could be interpreted actually as automation or as like um, 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 even like the text is like um, automatically created. They just use emoji because the majority of people actually on Facebook because they had a very large data set of comments and what they say is majority of people they are not communicating like academics on Twitter when they have a debate. Most users they write uh, 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 very short sentences, not even sentences, a combination of emoji or even like wrongly spelled words, single words, and they are still human users. So we need to be um, very careful, even the other way around, um, um, to kind of like be careful to not label human users as kind of like bots, and in reality, they're actually uh, human users. And um, with regards to uh, the Turing test and the bots, um, as far as I know, there is not really a bot who, who has uh, who has like passed uh, the test. But um, maybe maybe we will see in the future there will be a change. Thank you. Um, the next question is more on the method side, and the question is: What is the total sample size for each of the groups? Uh, that is the n. Uh, I had that slide up in the middle of the presentation. Overall, there were 4,400 something accounts. Um, and I think the majority was 2,000 something accounts were from the bottom meter training set. And the rest was, I think, roughly 50 50, or like I think there were a little over 1,000 humans. And again, like a little over 1,000 bots. Uh, and the second question in that regard is the size Can I say of. Say one thing? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's also a limitation we have to add. Um, yes. We have a very narrow data set and we, we specifically have chosen this one, but at the same time, these very uh, homogeneous groups um, um, are also a problem, a kind of like a limitation. So uh, maybe with other data sets, uh, Rotometer will um, work differently. Yes, uh, I think that's important to, to note. And also why you kind of like chose this data set was because we really wanted to be sure what we have in our data set, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise it gets very like tricky. And so the second part of the question is, is the size of N more important than the level of imbalance of the data set? On what is the impact of different values of N? I mean, a, a too small N of course is, is problematic. And then again, I would say like, it's, it's more about like, um, is the general population homogeneous or heterogeneous in which context you wanna use uh, a classifier? Uh, again, uh, with uh, typical uh, traditional sampling um, um, theory, uh, you can say the more heterogeneous 
uh, your population that you want to analyze, the larger the n, uh, also for your training data set, to really get um, uh, a, a, a good, good classifier. If you have a very, very homogeneous um, a data set, um, of course, um, you can even use a very small n and um, you will get a very good classifier. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Maria, and she asks, how does this compare with the R package tweet, bot, or not? And tweet, bot, or not, which one is this one? And I, I have to preface that answer with that we haven't checked specifically other packages against this. We know that there's, you know, like other uh, options of bot detection out there, um, which, you know, all have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we pick Botometer specifically since it's kind of like been used for most, like in most studies. Uh, and Adrian has pulled up, I believe, the R package right now. Yeah, exactly. No, I know now which um, it is. Um, it really depends um, what um, um, Mike Kearney was using to train um, his classifier. And as far as I understand it, he used probably even the same list, but he can maybe tell more about this if you ask him. I think he has chosen also like these um, obvious spots. So in that sense, I strongly believe um, that package will probably have a, a better performance than Bodometer if you use these um, accounts, but you need to check, right? If you use the accounts that were used to train the classifier, of course, you will get an excellent performance. So again, our recommendation is that even if you get an almost perfect um, um, classification with an artificial training data set, use it with um, uh, the, the population you want to analyze and then validate really what you get there um, as like as bot classified accounts and manually check how many of them are actually false positives. And then at the same time, and this is more difficult because usually the majority of accounts will not be classified as bots, right? You still need to check, and this is a lot more difficult because then you have a very large data set, right? How many of the um, uh, bots were wrongly classified or not identified and wrongly classified as human account? So you need this kind of manual classification um, anyway. Awesome, thank you. So we have seven more minutes. So we'll try to keep our answers short to get through all the questions uh, because I was, I was told we have until 1.05. Uh, so Mason asks, are you aware of any use of bot classifiers by platforms as part of their content management strategies? And if so, do you think these classifiers are doing more harm than good? And I personally, you know, like haven't talked to anyone you know within the social media platforms about that i would assume that they have classifiers that they use amongst others for content management um you know like obviously platforms don't want bots just like rampaging around on their platforms uh and it you know it, I think if they don't invest also heavily in human, you know, like eyeballs that check and validate the mm -hmm. accounts that they're removing automatically, I think there might be some, some harm being done along the way. What do you think, Adrian? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, I mean, obviously they are, they have probably their own classifier and they have like a, a, a lot more information available, right? We only, um, also the creators of bottom meter, they only have the information available that you actually see when you open uh, a tweet or an account, um, basically what the API returns. Um, Twitter, of course, they have uh, all this backend data when uh, users logged in, um, the IP addresses, right? Uh, this information we actually lack. And I think if you have that information, um, it's easier to, um, or it's, it's, it's easier to create a, a good classifier. But again, probably what the platforms um, think about, they really think about this false positive rate, right? So again, there is really a cost. If the false positive rate is too high and you really uh, say every account that is above a certain threshold, you kind of block them, right? And you block too many real human users, of course, um, it will have like consequences and people, people become 
um, aware of it. So I think they are rather conservative with this. What is your, in, in your opinion, Jonas, what do you think? I agree. Uh, okay, Paula asks, thank you, Jonas and Adrian, fantastic work. It is clear that bottom meter is not reliable to identify bots, but what other methods do you recommend? I agree that bots are not the major problem, but they still pollute the, pu pollute the public sphere. And I think the, the, the quick answer to that, to kind of like get to other questions as well, is do several methods at the same time always manually validate, which is kind of like, you know, annoying. You kind of like do automation to get away from this because it's just like time intensive. Uh, uh, but you know, like you have to do this in, in, in any instance. Uh, I personally like network method detection, like network detection, but these are also very time intensive and there you too have to kind of like manually validate. And, and so what do you think, Adrian? Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Um, there are methods um, to, to identify them, maybe clearly, but um, this really means uh, 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 like you need to look into the data and do some data crunching and look at it from different perspective, but definitely not use uh, a classifier in that process. Okay, uh, Yen Ting from NTU, Adrian asks, have you already figured out that the, so since you have already figured out that the diagnostic ability of bottom meter will differ because of languages, but do you think that different social media would also interfere with the precision of bottom meter, although all in English? Like we use the same classifier for a different social media platform, yeah. Definitely, if the same, let's assume there's another social media platform that has exactly the same affordances more or less, right? What you get back um, is exactly the same. You have something like shares, which uh, is a retweet. You have uh, replies, you have mentions, all the same exists. I would say, um, of course, there are always cultural differences. We can even stay within, within Twitter, right? Um, or we can move to another platform where it's maybe even more obvious, not something like Instagram. Um, in some countries, for example, um, uh, the, the, the kind of comment section is extremely important, right? And, and a lot of things are happening there. And in other cultures, maybe the comment section is not so important. So if you create a classifier and in one culture uh, where the comments are not so important, um, you classify users that post a lot of comments as kind of like bots because there is automation. And then you use that classifier in the other culture it would probably kind of like uh, identify a lot of human users that really write comments as, as bots. So we also need to be aware, not only about like it's a different, different platform with different affordances, we also should consider within one platform, of course, um, there are like uh, different, different cultural spheres in which um, social media are used um, differently. Awesome, thank you. And so the final question of the day or the night for you, uh, it is what is the ideal way to create gold standard data sets for bot research? Is it possible for humans to classify bots in the wild? I think there are two parts, gold standard within communication science, gold standard within computer science. So let me, because we don't have enough time, let me talk about the one in, in, um, in, uh, in communication science. So like I say, with the sentiment analysis, we assume we as human coders can identify the sentiment if we read a text, but we know also from content analysis, sometimes there's a lot of ambiguity. It's not that simple, right? Um, if we use the same for um, bots, we have to assume that we as humans can um, recognize uh, bots. So the gold standard in that sense is like you as a human take a sample from the population and manually um, classify uh, these accounts where you can even give a score, right? Um, uh, for the bottiness, you could check that, right? And then you compare um, the values you get with the values that the automatic classifier um, uh, gets. So from a communication science perspective, of course, the gold standard of what I would say, or I, I think also uh, most of my colleagues would agree with is like what we as human coders um, 
are seeing. And then you can even go further, actually, in communication science, we say, like, it's not enough that just one code, especially with sentiment, I would say it's not just enough that I check it, because if we just compare sentiment analysis between what Jonas sees in a tweet and what I see in the tweet, even if we are from the same culture, probably there is not like 100% overlap, right? You maybe even have to add more than um, one you encoder, and then you can com compare um, the kind of like uh, labels that we give as human coders. This is the gold standard, obviously, with um, the what the classifier gives. So in our case, we can test in this case here a bottom meter because we took obvious accounts, right? It's very clear these accounts we have selected are either bots um, or humans, but I would say in the general Twitter population, um, they're also actually probably bots that are not just labeled as bots, and then you need actually a human who first has to identify them. And that's like um, manual coding. So the gold standard, again, um, to answer this question, in my opinion, is like the human coding, maybe even more than one human coder. What do you think, Jonas? I think that sounds about right. And due to time, I, I will just refer to Adrian's perfect answer. Uh, and with that, I think we we'll, can wrap up this event. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I hope if you've got questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to us. I think the chat on is Twitter. still open. Yeah. Yes, I believe we are on Twitter. We are. Uh, you can also find us uh, on our institutions' websites. I hope you all stay safe and healthy, and uh, we'll see each other the next with the next virtual event. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Bye bye. Bye.